Welcome to the online teaching ministry of Pastor Rob Ginter and Farmdale Baptist Church. For more content, visit us online at farmdalebaptist.com. How would you respond if you knew that everything you owned would be taken from you and everyone you know would be abused? How would you respond in a moment like that? You see, that is the dilemma that Habakkuk is dealing with here in this book. After the pronouncements that we've seen, he had heard devastating words from God. He said, God, why, how long will you make me look at this world like it is without you doing something to intervene? God said, I am doing something to intervene, something unbelievable, so I'm going to have to tell you what it is. I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans, these enemies of yours, to take over the people of God because of the vast sin in the land. So Habakkuk has gotten this pronouncement here. And what do you do in a moment like this? Now, we might not have ever gotten news like this, but we've gotten some kind of version of this, right? There are versions of crises that we deal with. I had a family reunion this past weekend, and one of uh, a kid that I used to play with at the family reunions we had years ago, so he's my age, um, or I'm a little bit older, but anyway, he, he got a cancer diagnosis after he'd already been through cancer. And I talked to his, his mom, and he said he was, he's not doing very good with it. That he's, he's kind of closed up because of it. So we, we, we get phone calls that we don't want. We get news that we don't want. We hear things that we don't want to hear. We have crises that we... No one asks for this. right? There's no line for these events that we deal with. There's no line for sickness, death, tragedy, destruction, heartache, heartbreak. There's no line for this stuff. The question is, what do we do in the middle of that? What does Habakkuk do in the middle of that? How does Habakkuk respond? He prays. And you might think, exactly. That's exactly what I would do. I would pray that everything that I'm dealing with would go away. Maybe you have prayed that. Lord, make all of this go away. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray that. Lord, make this situation go away. Resolve it. Heal it. Take care of it. Intervene. I'm not saying those are things wrong. Not at all. Not at all. However... In Habakkuk 3, we're going to see that there are more important things to pray than make this go away. I even rhymed it for you. There are more important things to pray than make this go away. First off, let's not overlook the fact that the response to certain judgment in the land in a major crisis, he sings this prayer to God. So if you look down in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1, and you see a word that Looks like it doesn't make sense. Or it looks like Habakkuk speaking in tongues. He is not. He's speaking in his native tongue, I guess. Shigianoth is, is, is a, a melodic thing, right? It's, it's a prayer. He's singing this prayer to God. That's what he's doing. He's just told of coming judgment of those who worship things and people that aren't God. And he's told why. Because God is in his temple. The job is taken. Okay, so the job is taken. God's coming to judge. Crisis is now here. So what happens after this pronouncement of judgment? He prays. Now, 
Notice what, what he's doing here in, in verses three, uh, in verses one and two of Habakkuk three. He is responding to God instead of responding to his circumstances. So let me say, it's not wrong for us to pray in troubled times and tough times. God, make this stop. Make this go away. But yet, we should pray. So one of the most important things you can do in the middle of trouble, in the middle of crisis, is look at how you respond to God. So yes, don't just sit on your roof while the floods rise and refuse all the lifeboats that come by. You know this, that, that old preacher's joke. Don't just sit on your roof while, while there's a flood. Respond to circumstances, certainly. If your house is on fire, hit the exits. It's just common sense. Wisdom that the Lord has given us. Respond with godly wisdom. However, be real careful that you actually monitor, pay attention to how you're responding to God in the middle of crisis. That's the most important thing, is how we respond to God in the middle of crisis. So, we can't control, we might not be able to control what's going on. We can't control whether or not we'll keep our job. We can't control whether we will keep our health. We can't control many, many things. But one thing we can control is how we respond to God. And Habakkuk prays. We should pray. I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones that said, give yourself to every inkling to pray. That's good advice. It's very good advice. If you've got this little rock in your shoe, it feels like that you should turn your thoughts toward God, take it. So I want to ask for you to pray for them. Do it. Right then. Putting off praying normally leads to social media. Putting off praying usually leads to napping. Putting off praying usually leads to watching TV. So we should respond to God in prayer. And Habakkuk gives us three requests that we ought to pray for in the midst of crisis beyond just make this stop. Go to verse 2 with me. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O oh Lord. Do I fear? In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Mercy. So the first thing that we should pray for God to do is to revive his work. Revive his work. You see that he is encouraging himself there in the verse with what the Lord has done in the past. You see, the future's blind us, and there is no way we can know exactly how it's going to work out. The future, it is a mystery. The only thing that we can know tomorrow is things about how God is going to act. We can know stable attributes of God. Immutable. He, that means he's unchanging. Not like those turtles that walked into the goo and then they grew to be six feet. And they put on masks. And they fought crime in the evenings. And they always are teenagers. They never grow up. Teenage mutant Ninja Turtles, if you're like, I have no idea what he's talking about. That's what it is. You see, that's different than God. He doesn't mutate. He is immutable. That means he doesn't change. So what do you know about tomorrow? You don't know anything about tomorrow except for one thing. That God will not change in it. That's all you know. 
Because if you look at yourself and you look in the mirror, you understand that you yourself are consistent in your inconsistency. You're consistently inconsistent. You have moods. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. You know who doesn't have moods? God. He doesn't. He doesn't change. So we can comfort ourselves with what he has already done, who he has already been, and why is that comforting? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is a comfort for us. That we know that he is not going to change. Because God is unchanging or immutable, the prophet can say, I do I fear. I re, I'm in reverence, in awe of you. Because I've heard the report of you and your work, O oh Lord, do I fear. So because of that, what you've done before, please do it again. Do it again. Do it again. He's not asking God, change your plan. Don't, don't you find that's interesting here, right? The Chaldeans are coming. Don't you think that Habakkuk would then respond by praying, God make the, uh, the, the Chaldeans go away? That's not what we see here. Now, certainly that's in his prayer for the Lord to in his wrath remember mercy. Certainly part of that is that, right? Relieve suffering that we're going to see in just a minute. Relieve suffering. That's what mercy is. But here he's not asking God to change the plan. He's saying, God, even during judgment and crisis, do your work in reviving us. It'd be as if you're going through a hard day and say, God, I know you work all things out for good and that for those that love you and are called to the, your purpose, well, I love you. Work this unemployment for good. Let me love you more because I've gone through this. It's like he's pray praying, work it to good and wake us up spiritually because of it. Wake us up. Don't make it up. Wake us up. That's what he's asking. Do you know who else needs that? Other people other than you. And you know who also needs that? You. You. And me. And me. In the middle of crisis... We should pray for the Lord to revive his work in us. Revive his work in us. And notice, because he does pray and he does this like this, revive your work, do it again. I've heard of your work in the midst of the years. Revive it. You see him praying like this? What is he doing? Well, let me tell you what he's certainly not doing. He's not settled with just hearing about what God has done in the past. He's not just okay with that. Needless to say, one of the, some of the saddest stories I hear as a pastor is who people used to be in their service to the Lord. That's, that's some of the saddest stuff that I hear is who I used to be when I used to serve the Lord in a certain way. That's some of the saddest stuff, right? I used to do this in the church. What about now? What about now? I used to be this kind of person. What about now? Who are you now? Because as we mentioned in the last few weeks, when crisis hits, you don't have who you used to be to help you in any way. 
You don't have who you're going to be, a, a more mature version of you, to come back and be like, son, listen, this is how you ought to handle this. No, when crisis hits, all you have is what you believe about God in this moment. Like, that is what you have to cling to. Not remembering who he used to be, who he is. That's who you'll find most helpful. Now, sometimes we need to go back and look at who he used to be to understand who he is, right? I'm not saying those two things are disconnected. But you just have your maturity level, your walk with the Lord in this moment. Crisis is a snapshot of what you really believe about God. And that snapshot could be an ugly picture. And how do you know if it's an ugly picture? The devastation. The devastation that you feel that you... It hits a little harder than it should. It stings a little more than you'd think it would. That's what it's like. So Habakkuk is not okay with who God used to be, what God used to do. That's one thing. Secondly, he's not okay with secondhand knowledge of God. Secondhand knowledge of God. Right? He's wanting to revive it now. That's the implication of uh, verse 2 is in the midst of the years, revive it. It's in like, so th those were the years gone by. This is the moment now. Revive it here. Revive it now is the implication of the verse. So secondhand smoking, I think we've all figured this out, whether you smoke or you don't. Um, secondhand smoking is no good. It's no good. And I think we see here in Habakkuk 3 that secondhand knowledge of God, it's not really going to cut it for you. It's not good. It's no good. Now, I'm not saying that other people's walk with the Lord, other people's uh, trust in Christ can't help you. It absolutely does, absolutely should. But you, you know this, you need your own. You need your own. Because their trust in Christ is not going to be something you can cling to when the night gets dark. It's not. Now it's helpful. Tell me what the Lord has done for you. Tell me what he's brought you through. Absolutely. Conversations we should have with each other. Tell me the, 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 the battle stories of how the, the Lord has won war after war after war for you. Tell me that stuff. But above and beyond that, we need him to revive his work in our life, not just their life. That's it. We need it for us. And the prophet is not okay with just hearing about God's work. He desires firsthand knowledge of God's work. You know what that means? His day was what we would consider a bad day. A bad day. God is bringing judgment. And he's not asking God to, to change that. He's asking God that he would revive his work in the midst of that trouble. And by monitoring, paying close attention how we respond to God. Like, so if someone's going through something terrible, my question for them, for you, is for us, is how are you responding to God in that? What's that look like for you? Because Habakkuk is proof of, of one thing also, that just because you suffer, it doesn't mean that your spiritual life has to suffer. Right? That's, those two don't always have to be the same. Now, certainly, sometimes people suffer in all ways. <laughs> like, it, it, it bleeds over. Suffering bleeds over. If you can't have, be pain-free enough to stand upright, it's going to be hard to focus on something, anything. When you're in excruciating pain, it's going to be hard to focus. So that could affect you spiritually. 
because you can't focus. But what he shows us is just because you're suffering doesn't mean doesn't have to mean that your spiritual life has to suffer. It doesn't. So if you find yourself in a spiritual desert, pray this, that God would revive his work in your life. You come to the realization of the psalmist in Psalm 63, who says, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land when there is no water. When you do that, you come to the realization there's nothing sustainable outside of God for you. Habakkuk's not asking for his work to be re uh, renewed, but God's work to be renewed. We have to come to this place where we realize that he is all there is for us. Like the song says, hallelujah, all I have is Christ. All I have is Christ. That's it. The good news, my friends, is that's all you, Christ is all you need. The good news is he's all you have. And the better news is he's all you need. And if you're in a crisis or a spiritual desert, the verse, these verses just remind us that we have this example in the prophet that we can do in our own life to ask God not to, to do work for other people in other years and other times. And man, it's amazing how on, on fire for the Lord that so-and-so used to be. Good for them, good for the past, but how about now? Ask the Lord to revive his work in days that look like this one. Days that look like this one. Habakkuk's proof of him asking for that in a day you don't want to be in. Nobody's signing up to be in a war zone. Right? Nobody's like, hey, I would love to go on vacation to the Ukrainian-Russian border right now. Nobody wants to go on vacation there. So nobody signs up for this stuff. Nobody wants to be a part of war, of crisis, or tragedy. Unfortunately, it happens whether you want to, whether you sign up or get in that line or not. And the good news is, is that you can pray for God to revive his work, even in the middle of what seems like a war zone. And how do we get there? Well, we have to be dissatisfied with our Christian resume. That's one thing. So take our Christian resume who we used to be, what we've done for the Lord that led us up to this moment and praise him for it and disregard it. And get to the now with the Lord. Get to the now with the Lord. Secondly, we have to be dissatisfied not just with our resume, but also with secondhand knowledge of God. To say that I need to know him for myself in these moments. In these moments. In the here and now. And we should ask him to revive his work. And what, what will that look like? What will that look like? Asking God to re revive his work in our, in our life and in our heart. Well, the second prayer request from Habakkuk in the second half of verse 2 he asked for God to reveal himself. Reveal himself. So revive it. So in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. Make it known. So that's the next phrase in this. This is similar but separate request. God, revive what you're doing and make me aware of it. How can you know what God's doing in the midst of the years? Well, there's things that God, as we've seen before, there's things that God knows that you don't know because you're in a different category than him. But what this is, we might be bogged down in the midst of us, but this is an encouragement 
to drive us towards the awareness of God. So why is that tragedy so hard to deal with? Why is that struggle so hard? Because we might be blind, distracted to this very thing right here, the awareness of God, the awareness of God in our circumstance, the awareness of God. Do you see this maturity in the life of Habakkuk that we have, have, have grown in the last three weeks together? Or four, I think it's three. What's the maturity? Well, he starts this thing in the beginning. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear or cry to you violence and you won't save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you look idly by at wrong? Destruction and violence are for me, before me. Strife and contention arise. That's how we started this thing. God, why don't you do something about evil? And he's prayed. And he's grown. And, and what is a, what's Christian maturity look like that I want to get to and I want us all to get to? It's to not go to God being like, why are you so lazy? Instead... Lord, I know you're working. I know you're working. I, don't, I know you don't ever sleep. I know you don't ever rest. I know that you do not need rest or sleep. And you are constantly working in your world. I ask that you would give me an awareness of what you're doing or your presence, even if I don't know what you're doing. See the difference? See the maturity there? See the grown-upness? I don't think that's a word. Not, why, are you, why, aren't you, why are you doing nothing? No, that's an accusation, my friends. That's an accusation of laziness on the one who keeps the world spinning. No, what does this look like? It's like, show me yourself, because I know that you're there. Make me aware, because I know you're working. That's what maturity looks like going further in the text that we see in the life of the prophet. He's not crying, asking God, why don't you do something? But now he's experienced God, and his question is, show me what you're doing. Show me what you're doing. Reveal yourself to me in the midst of this. I know you're acting. I, know, I don't know exactly what you're doing. Just make me aware of you. Make me aware of you. So, as we figure that out, the last chapter, in the last chapter, God told the prophet that the knowledge of the glory of God would cover the earth like waters cover the sea. So we should pray that God would reveal himself to us and then spend some serious time in his word in order for it to do, to do it knowing that what we're dealing with, God is working toward the end of spreading his glory all over the whole earth. How's your, how's your situation going to end? I don't know. How's the crisis going to stop? I don't know. How's the pain going to heal? I don't know. But I do know that the future and the culmination of all things is speeding quickly and swiftly to the glory of God covering the entire earth. Toward a new creation, a new heavens, and a new earth. All things being made new. All things being covered in the glory of the Lord. I do know that, based on Habakkuk. We might not know what God's doing. We might not get specific details like Habakkuk, but we can file and filter everything we're doing, dealing with, through the Romans 8.28 category. That for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. So we know that everything is going to culminate in the display of the glory of God for the good of the people of God. 
I know those two things about the future. I know those two things. How will it end? I don't know. How, what's going to happen to this pain? I don't know. But I do know that everything will go and fit in its place for the glory of God and the good of those who love God and that are called according to his purpose. Those two things are certainly true. So we might not understand the fog that we're driving through, but we can know that the destination of the road ahead is the glory of God and the good of, of the people of God. Amen. So instead of praying, simply God, make all these bad things go away, pray, God, revive your work in my life. Reveal yourself to me. And thirdly, remember your mercy. Remember your mercy. That's the third appeal. For God in his wrath to remember mercy. To see, we'll call it. In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Unlike many of us, Habakkuk's discussion doesn't argue with God about what he calls sin or whether or not he should punish it. He knows that the wrath of God is coming to punish the disobedient. He starts from that baseline. He doesn't have to say, God, please punish. He just says, when you do, <laughs> when you do, remember mercy. Because he knows, not just because of this conversation, but Exodus 34, 7, it's true that God will by no means clear the guilty. He will not. Because of that, notice what Habakkuk doesn't ask for. He doesn't ask for justice. He doesn't ask for justice. Why? Because only fools shake their fist at God and say, give me what I deserve. Only fools do that. Give me what's coming to me. Only fools look at God and say, give me what you should give me. This one song says, if we fought for our rights, we'd be in hell tonight. Mere sinners owed nothing but a fierce hand. We never loved him. We pushed away his pierced hands. That would be the destination, my friends. If you said, God, put me and take me where I belong tonight. Well, welcome to the lake of fire, my friends. Enjoy your eternal stay. Because that's what we all deserve. The wrath of God. Because we've sinned against an infinitely holy God and therefore are infinitely worthy of his punishment. Jonathan Edwards says the wrath of God is like great waters that are restrained for the present but they increase more and more. They rise higher and higher. Here's what he writes. If God should only withdraw his hand from the floodgate, it would immediately fly open and the fiery floods of the fierceness and wrath of God would rush forth with inconceivable fury and would come upon you with an omnipotent power. And if your strength were 10,000 times greater than the strength of the stoutest, sturdiest devil in hell... It would be nothing to withstand or endure it. It's like your closet when you were a kid. I remember one time, one of my quickest cleaning jobs as a kid. Mom well, was like, clean this room now. And I was like, okay. So she left. And I put everything under my bed. Kicked it all under there. I mean, just like everything. Everything that wouldn't go in the closet, it was under the bed. And I came out and bragged about how I was done. And she walks in. You know, she, she, she wasn't dumb. She knew I, it should have taken me longer than that. So what does she do? Man, she, she looked under that bed first thing when she came in there. And there it all was. Because I couldn't do anything about it. She opened the closet and it all came pouring out. 
because I tried to hide it, I tried to get away from it, but there's absolutely, positively nothing that I could do with it. That's what, that is what the wrath of God is like toward the person who's not a Christian. That's what it's like. You hide it under the bed, you put it in the closet. There's going to be a day when the bed's inspected and so is the closet. Because God is holy and righteous and just. That means he will always do what is right and best. He's not like us. But see, he created us in, in his image and we rebelled against him. We rebelled against him. And instead of that sea of wrath consuming all of us for all time, in the presence of God being empty of all of us, God became a man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he walked among us. He lived the perfect life that God required of us, my friends. I was sharing the gospel at the uh, Burgoo Festival with a gentleman the other day, and he was just really convicted about, uh, about it. And he started looking in a way and finding people to talk to while I was talking to him. And I got to what God did for sinners. And you know what he said? I need to go get a lemonade. I need to go get a lemonade. After I told him what God did for sinners, he said, I've got, that makes me want to go get a lemonade. He, like, he didn't say it like that, but like, I have to go get a lemonade. You understand that, that the wrath of God is a certain and sure on us, and it's not a flippant little thing for us. It's not like you can hear this information and go on with your day. Because it, was, it is certain and it is on you. But there is good news. Jesus Christ took that cup of wrath from the Father and he drank it like a lemonade to the bottom. He drank the wrath that is due you. He drank it for you, in your place, for your sins. So no matter what crisis that we're going through, no, no matter what trouble this day brings or that is weighing heavy on us that we, we don't know, like potential crisis is almost as anxiety-inducing as actual crisis. No matter what that is and what that looks like and what trouble that is, if you're not a Christian today, instead of wrath, you can ask God for mercy. For mercy. So what sort of Habakkuk says, God, in your wrath, remember mercy. So this wrath is this avalanche of punishment that you were due. And mercy is what God offers you for Christ in your place. That's what it is. And if you're going through crisis and trouble and struggle, or if you look ahead and you see it coming... Realize this, that God is rich in mercy. It's rich in mercy. So in Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah is sifting through the rubble of the judgment of God, asking God to remember his affliction, his wandering, his bitterness. It's a rough day. But here's what he says in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 20. My soul continually remembers it, and I am bowed down within me, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end, my friends. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. You woke up this morning and laid out on the bed for you were your clothes. And the Lord, for the Christian, for the person of God, he lays out new mercies like clothes on a bed. For you to get them today. It's available today. So if you're in crisis, you're in trouble, you're in struggle, you can ask God to remember mercy because it is available. It's available. It's all laid out for you. It's new today. There is sufficient mercy from the Lord today for you. So say to yourself... (laughs) Say to your soul, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in Him. New day, new mercy. Habakkuk knew this about God, so he asked for it. He asked for it. That God would not just renew him, that He would not just reveal Himself, but that he would remember his mercy. If you're not a Christian, Ephesians 2 addresses this subject, that that we, or you, depending on who you are, are by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But what about God? He is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, He made us alive together in, with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So this wrath and punishment of God, if you're not a Christian, is upon you because you have sinned against Him. And the good news is, is that there is mercy and grace. There's goodness from God. There is hope and forgiveness for everything that you've done available to you from God. So we're going to pray here in just a second. Pastor Jonathan is going to come. If you are in need of mercy and you want to find out more about that, I'd love to talk to you about the Lord's mercy for us. If you are a Christian, even if today isn't a day of crisis or trouble, if today's a day of of apathy. If today is a day of looking back on your Christian life, of how you used to be, this is the same three things I would tell you to pray. Same three things. Revive your work in me, reveal yourself to me, and remember your mercy for me. So I want you to take this little bulletin If that's you, I want you to take it home with you. Pray these three things to God. Ask Him to do this in you, for you, and to you. Let's pray together. Lord, I do pray that you would revive your work in our lives in such a way that you reveal yourself to us as you are on this day, unchangeable now, yesterday, now, and always. And I pray that we would be people who are aware of your presence. Please do that. Please make yourself aware and make us aware of you. I pray that you'd save people among us who do not know you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, remember your mercy towards us in the midst of those of us going through heartache through trouble, through crisis, through struggle. Right now are those that see it coming down the road. I pray for your mercy. And I give you thanks for the mercy that you've given us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the grace of God towards us. In him we have grace upon grace. In his name we pray. Amen.